what a wonderful conference this has been and it's going to continue to be today. Let us welcome, firstly we have this beautiful lady here, Frances Sue. Uh, Frances has a deep calling to go beyond the concepts and live a life that is guided by Holy Spirit. She graciously accepted to be a, me a messenger, not a member, a messenger of God. So let's welcome Frances. And, of course, he's all colour coordinated, have you noticed? <laughs> With the venue. <laughs> David Hoffmeister. is a beautiful example of the awakened mind. And we're all walking each other home. And David's walking with us and he's shining a really bright light for us to follow. And I know I'm very grateful for that and um, I'm sure you all are as well. So welcome David. And um, here we are, I hand you over to these lovely people. So good to be back in Melbourne again. I see a lot of dear friends and a lot of new friends and this is part of a world tour for us. So we've been over in uh, China and Japan and now we've dropped down here to Melbourne. So we feel we're going to have a very intimate day with you. And we feel very fortunate to have the whole day with you because we can we can just dive deep into this experience together. And it gives a nice spaciousness, so that if you want to raise topics or questions, uh, Francis and I are, are very transparent, so don't hesitate to ask any question. You don't have to try to be spiritually correct here with us. Uh, you can just ask anything, and the feeling is we're all in this together, so there are no private thoughts, there are no secrets, and that's what we're learning as we connect with God. That God wants to be fully revealed in us and through us, and the way that that happens is when we are able to be transparent and then able to see that, that these egoic thoughts are not who we are, and they are, were never a part of our true reality and our identity. So, I feel what we all bring and what we offer is a lot of examples of living A Course in Miracles in our life. A lot of metaphors, a lot of, we could say, parables of David and parables of Francis that we offer that will shed some light in how to live this in daily life. Because the curriculum is highly individualized for all of us, but we can, we can learn from each other, from each other's experiences. And it can be a way of miracles collapse the time, make it shorter, so we get that resonance in our hearts, and we go, oh, I see, I see, I understand. We, we're here to awaken, we're not here to delay. We're not here to suffer, we're not here to struggle. Those are egoic reactions to the light. You might say the ego is resisting the light. And as long as we're identified with the ego, it seems like our reactions, even though we're experiencing its feelings. And we want to dive deep into a practical experience so quickly that we are not any longer experiencing the ego as a reality, that we literally unplug from the ego and experience ourselves as love, as divine love and light. And we just flow with that divine love and light. So, I just want to welcome everybody. I'm so grateful that you're here. I'm so grateful that we can share this time together. And, uh, 
And let Francis introduce herself. Yeah, thank you for having me today here. It's really an honor to actually come back to Australia to have met you because um, I left China um, where I grew up from. I moved to Australia, to Sydney, and my life just changed completely here. Um, that's where I actually um, came across A Course in Miracles, and I... You know, I couldn't stop reading about it. I couldn't stop talking about it. I thought I need to start a group just so that I can talk about it whenever <laughs> I want to talk about it. So I started a meetup group in Sydney, um, a course miracle meetup group. And um, from the second time when people came to the meetup group, they started to talk to me about someone called David Hofmeister. And now looking back, it's almost like the whole purpose of me setting up that group is eventually lead me to, you know, meet David and be able to really see how deep this pathway is and also be able to, de you know, devote my life to this. Because what happened for me in the past few years of really going deep with the Course is that I realized it actually un undid my intellectual mind so much that inevitably it connected me with this inner teacher that this book is really pointing to. And this is such a, a, a journey of experience and this is really why we are so in love with this pathway and with everything that that come across this pathway and curriculum because it really get in touch, get us in touch with this internal teacher and the love that we are. So, yeah, so it is an honor to come back and thank you for inviting me. I can't wait to share about anything that you want to hear about along this pathway and answer any question you have. I'm here at your service. Thank you. And thanks so much for Kate and Patricia for inviting us and Sophie and what a wonderful auditorium we have today. Um, some of you know I like to use movies and movie clips, audio visuals, and we have a capacity for that today too, so as the time allows, we may just go to the big screen. And in fact, I'm feeling that big screen pretty strong. Some of you, uh, some of you have heard of Monty Python, and some of you know John Cleese. And he has been such a gift, thank goodness he's part of our wake-up team. And and we're in a university setting, so we thought we would open up today with John Cleese inviting us into our hearts in a university setting. So here's our friend Jeffrey, take it away. Lights, camera, action. Should I read this? 
about yourself without my having your post knows more about you. I want more. This week, I want secrets. Things other people don't know. Things you don't know. Yet. Because, you see, the clues to who you are are buried in those secrets. It's like hidden gold under a 20-foot pile of gold. Only you can look through it, but guess what? It's in there. The truth, waiting patiently after all the horse shit that is the build-up of our silly little lives. So, go in and get it, people. Dig for the truth. And people, please, spelling, it's poor. So, I'll see you next week. I think you'll start seeing if you're doing the work and staying with the course is that being honest every day knowing what you think knowing what you feel is very revealing doors are being opened boxes that have not been rummaged in for quite some time are being looked through later as we wind the course down and I read your journals I should know you intimately, perhaps better than anyone else knows you, except, of course, yourself. Excuse me. Sir? What do you mean, uh, read our journals? I don't don't think that's going to work for me. I'm a very private person. Okay, but you may as well leave now, because there is really no point in your stay. Well, it's not that. I'm just not that comfortable. I'm not interested in you. I'm a scientist. I'm a doctor. I do not get cheap thrills reading someone's journal. I am here to give you the tools to help you to uncover discard and discard the crap that is holding back. And you, sir, definitely have crap. Sex, a full look at the worst, Thomas Hardy. Who? Who? Who's Thomas Hardy? Is that what you're asking? Yes, I am. Are you not a college man, Mr. Gilman? Community college, two years, but I believe education can only take you so far. Quite right. Absolutely true. But, ego. <laughs> will not get you the rest of the way. It will take you, yes, it will clothe you well, but it will leave you cold and alone and under. I promise. But if you would prefer to leave, please go. I don't choose to leave. Very well. So when I ask you to turn in your journal for me and me alone to read, just do it. And remember the spelling. It's a thing. That's the way everyone should start out their Course in Miracles practice. With a good laugh and prepared, like Thomas Hardy say, said, to look at the full extent of the worst. See, the human condition, as we know it, is just the surface projection of an unconscious mind that Carl Jung called the shadow. So what Thomas Hardy was pointing to was saying, in order to really know yourself, know the truth, it takes looking at the full extent of the worst that is in you, or seems to be in you. Because we've been tricked to think that it's, it's who we are. These are dark thoughts and beliefs in our mind, when it's actually an imposter masquerading as ourself. 
using the power of our mind to act as a parasite, feeding off the powerful mind of the child of God and using the power of that mind to make a fabrication, to make a false self, an unreal self and an unreal world that keeps us distracted from be still and know that I am God, from the still journey that meditation takes us to, that all great spiritual traditions have taken us to, that all the mystics and avatars and saints all point to this still state of mind. You could call it nirvana, you can call it the kingdom of heaven, you could call it whatever you want. They're taking us in to that state of mind. So, when you work with A Course in Miracles, Jesus comes right out and says about his workbook, at the conclusion of the workbook, that this course is a beginning and not an end. That we are not going to reach that state of mind or we reach the truth through words, but the ego made up the words and the spirit can use anything that the ego made. And even though words are symbols of symbols twice removed from reality, they can point us back to that leaping point in our minds where we drop and we sink inward into that stillness that Jesus called the Kingdom of Heaven within. So, I think this has been an amazing conference because we had amazing talks on the first day, we had experiential exercises, there's been Lots of joy, socializing, coming to get to know like-minded people from around here locally and from around Australia as a way of Holy Spirit saying, relax, I've got it. Just come and relax and enjoy the ride. Don't make too much of this. Don't get caught up too much into theories or into fears and doubts. Just keep coming, keep coming deeper and deeper in. And then with Gary's humor yesterday and the beautiful teachings in metaphysics, it's another invitation to say, relax, laugh, come closer, come deeper, because the experience is what you've always wanted. And you were just looking outside of yourself, you were looking to the objects and images of time and space to satisfy yourself, but they will never satisfy you. These images were made by the ego, and in one sense we could say they're like idol images. They've been made to keep your attention on the surface of consciousness, and keep you from going much, much deeper. But the call of spirituality is very deep. The Course in Miracles actually uh, We've been having some lunches with the publisher, Judy Scutch, and during one of the lunches she said that basically the publishing of the Course and the dissemination of the Course are part of what Ken Wapnick called Plan B. And so Judy was always like, Plan B? You mean all this work we're doing, publishing and translating is Plan B? What is Plan A if, if all of this is Plan B? And Kemba said, the actual living experience of what the Course points to, that you are guided to give yourself over to the happy dream. You are guided to give yourself over to the real world, that Jesus calls the real world, because this forgiven world is the goal of all practice. And you don't want to get delayed in the practice. You don't want to get uh, arrested or held back by the practicing tools. You have to remember, oh, those tools are just pointing me to an experience that is within me, it's within my mind. And that's what we're going for. And that's what we're going to be sharing about today because when I first picked up the Course, you know, I popped open to a number of passages as, as answers to prayers, but when I really was praying and saying, what is really important, Jesus? What is the most important thing? This is a big book. I remember opening up to 
This course will be believed entirely or not at all. And that's a very uncompromising statement. In other words, no bonus points, you don't get any bonus points when you go to open to the gate of heaven. You have to go all the way with this or you won't receive the benefits of what's offered. You can't really just use this course to, to brighten up your personal life because your personal life is, is a mask. That's what persona means. It's mask. And you won't be satisfied with the mask. You must drop beneath the mask. And we could say you must drop the mask of, of personality and of time and space to enter into the Kingdom of Heaven. And you won't be satisfied with anything less than the experience of who you are. How beautiful that John please comes out and says, starts off with, Who are you? Who am I? I'll see you next week. <laughs> you know? We needed professors like that. Here we are in a university. Imagine coming to a big lecture hall like this. And maybe if you were like me, I, I took so many classes that I would kind of move towards the back and I would do daydreaming in the back, the back seats. I'd get as far back as I could and I'd be daydreaming. But if I had a professor like that and asked me those questions, you better believe I would engage. Because that is the most engaging question there could ever be. Who am I? Truly, really. So our life has turned into this devotional prayer of, of every second, of every minute, of every day into living this experience. And I remember going through the whole course and I was getting all lit up. When you started to get to chapter 30 and chapter 31, I was like, oh yeah, rules for decision. Thank you, I need that. Um, when he was talking about self versus self-concept, I kept reading that section over and over because I said, oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying that everything I believe in, everything that I'm identified with in this world is part of a self-concept that was made to take the place of my Christ identity. And that's why Jesus and Buddha and all the mystics and saints have said, empty your mind of the contents of consciousness. As long as your consciousness is focused on these false images, false identities, then you can't know who you really are. So really, it's a course in miracles, but it's also a course in unlearning and emptying the mind of everything you think you think and think you know. And when I got back to that self-concept versus self-section, he said, salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts. He also made it very clear that forgiveness is the only helpful concept of all the millions, billions, trillions of concepts in the sleeping mind. There's only one concept that leads you out of all the rest, and that's forgiveness. So forgiveness is the conceptual learning goal of the Course. But it is an experiential Course. It is not meant to be simply a play of intellectual ideas. It is not meant to be an intellectual endeavor. Here we are in a university and we're, we're coming together for a different purpose other than learning things about the world. We're here to unlearn those and to learn to forgive. Now, he also says in that section that you will make many self-concepts as learning goes along. So some of you have noticed as you progressed through this seeming lifetime that your concept of yourself has changed from when you were a child, from when you were a teenager. Your concept goes, undergoes, keeps undergoing changes and I would say as we give the self-concept in our mind to the Holy Spirit it will continue to undergo a loss of changes. Because, as Gary said yesterday, you will not be hurled into reality. And the reason you won't be hurled in is because you will be given step-by-step -step concepts that you can still relate to as you keep unwinding and loosening. And even Course in Miracles teacher 
Course in Miracles too, those are just concepts too, those will go by as well. But some of us had thought, hmm, okay, it's a little awkward, I never thought I would be using words like miracle worker or teacher of God, but here we are and we start to let the Spirit play with us with those concepts for a while as we surrender everything over. When I met Frances, uh, it was very clear that she was very determined to go all the way with the Course and she traveled around to many different countries where I was speaking and she had to deal with things that most everybody deals with in the human race. You, you set certain things in motion, whether it's education, whether it's business, whether it's family, whether it's uh, things to do with politics, whatever you've set in motion, the Holy Spirit and Jesus are saying, give it to me and let me start using what you believe in so I can unwind you from what you believe in and take you higher and higher and higher in consciousness toward that abstract love and light that is the Christ, that is pure spirit. But you have to be unwound from your identification with these false concepts and identities because they aren't who you are, they're just stepping stones along the way. The Spirit will never destroy anything that the sleeping Son of God believes in. It's just a reinterpretation of what the Son of God believes in so that the Son of God can awaken to know the Christ, the light, the love that is our natural inheritance. So with Frances she had progressed from, from lots of the years of education, from, from business, working in finance, from having her own financial management business right there in Sydney, to having a husband, to having a couple houses, really on the world's scale it would be a very successful life. She had really attained and achieved that success that the world is, says you need to keep pointing in that direction. Otherwise you, you could really suffer if you are not a success. There's only two ways that the ego looks at that, it's success in the world and failure. And to it you must succeed, but then it will knock you off the pedestal as soon as you succeed anyway because it's a death wish. <laughs> it, it doesn't really know what success is. Even when you seem to succeed it will always throw lots of things to knock you off that pedestal. But for Frances she just said, okay, I want to join in fully, and that's been quite a journey. It's been a, a very practical journey of unwinding from these concepts and letting yourself be used in, in a, amazing, miraculous ways. Yeah, um, I, at the beginning I did talk about these um, major steps that I've taken in order to free up my life, but really free up my mind to allow myself to devote my mind to the practice. But um, many years later I realized that was the beginning. That was really not the hardest part of this journey. Not to scare you, but it's the, the what is happening is so much more fulfillment that is waiting. The, that Jesus actually has a plan for us, that this plan is so fulfilling, and yet we were so contained with a little plan that we did somehow design in our mind, and it's about nothing. And because of that, what our, our powerful mind is meant for is never really, you know, it's never gonna have this opportunity to achieve what it's meant for. And there is a huge suffering and pain for the mind that is used for something that is just not there. So I noticed that for myself to achieve this major transformation, not really about a person's journey or a body's transformation, it's really about this mind's transformation from believing in something that is so small and concrete and specific and 
and just conceptual beliefs to completely rise above it, this whole process needs a help, needs a helper, needs a guide. That is a very profound realization that I realized that the mind that is stuck in the matrix cannot wake itself up. And I tried, you know, with a very, very intellectual mind. When I first came across the Course in Miracles, I, the, the Course was helpful because it fed it. It actually fed my mind to be able to understand it and analyze the ego and also trying to find a way out, trying to figure out a formula uh, that applies to a specific situation, how to forgive. I want a formula. You know, that is what the mind energy was devoted to until gradually, somehow, while I kept practicing and practicing, what happened was the mind started to relax and drop all these blueprints that it draw for itself and started to come for something that is very, very simple. Just ask and wait and receive, which the ego mind does not understand how things can be this simple, how the answer can be this simple, because the problems are so complicated and are so fragmented and so specific. You know? But the Course actually, Jesus says in the Course, the ego believes in specifics and is reliant on specifics to maintain the separation. The answer is very, is unified answer comes from this source that is abstract. But yet the correction must happen. You know, we have to allow the correction to happen even at the specifics level. So that's where these two meet. You know, we don't just come from this specific life and situations and grievances and irritations to say, okay, I'm all love. And I, I will just affirm that ten times a day and I will be good. Or just saying, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. That's not how it worked. You know, for me, is we have to allow the specifics to be corrected, not by myself, by something that is really inside of our ourselves, and yet is a little foreign to us. And we have to consistently invite this guide and this helper to say, "Solve this for me, help me." Because there is a, a sentence that is very striking. Of course, it says creation and communication are synonymous. Creation and communication are synonymous. Why is that so important? That means to know our creator, we have to be like him. And to be like him, we have to be a communicator. A communication device. You know, Jesus says the only use of the body by the Holy Spirit is communication device. That is something that we in our lives practice again and again and again and watch how we want to use the body for anything else but communication device. For getting some pleasure, for getting anything, getting for attacking, for separating. But Jesus said, okay, the only use, as long as you still believe in the body, is to use it for a communication device. But I would say, actually, this mind is a communication device. Our mind energy is to be spent on communicating with the Holy Spirit. And that's it. That's it. To the extent we can give over our mind to the Holy Spirit, we will experience peace and joy. And I feel like for me, Holy Spirit was such a foreign concept. I came to Australia as an atheist. I did not know any spiritual book or spiritual idea. 
I think the first uh, book that was a little enlightening for me, I picked it up. I wouldn't have picked it up unless uh, it actually um, it's written on the cover that is written by uh, someone who is a Yale graduate. And I have to have that kind of credential for my mind to even be able to believe, okay, that, you know, that has some credit that I can spend some time looking into it. But from that kind of closed down mind, the spirit can crack it open. And it's not something this body did because behavior, any level of form, including behavior, has no creative power. What does that mean? That means it, it does not cause anything. It doesn't cause you to wake up, whatever you do. But what causes anything, what has a creative power, is the desire and the motivation that motivates that. So this whole journey for me is a journey to start to open up to, okay, maybe I can rely on something else other than me. And I can call upon him in the middle of a crisis, but also in the, in the middle of other times, not just crisis, but all throughout the day. Start the day with the call of the Spirit. Start the day, start the night, start the sleep. Every moment is devoted to this connection, to this communication with Him. And that happens, you know, in that, in that desire, in that connection, in that communication with Him. That's where the mind started to really expand and open up. And behavior happens. Perception changes. Belief drops. Concepts drops. Yeah, it's really a gift when you have that turnaround in mind or that sometimes it can even be a jolt in mind like, oh my gosh, I've been moving in the wrong direction. And sometimes it even comes with this feeling like I've been moving for a long, long time in the wrong direction. Um, some months ago we saw the trailer for the movie Doctor Strange and uh, all my friends in America were going, you went to see Doctor Strange? I said, yeah, it came out a week early in Australia. <laughs> uh, they're like, what? It doesn't open till November 4th. But we went, Linda, a group of us went, and um, it's a story too of a, of a medical doctor who's such a genius. You know, he does brain surgery, and he's so articulate, he's so well-read. He's so good at being a, a physician, a doctor, a surgeon and everything, but he has so much pride, so much arrogance. He's so full of himself, or so full of this artificial self that the ego has made up. He's very successful in the world, but he's got this arrogance and pride. And then as he goes to meet the Ancient One, I think it's Tilda Swinton plays the character, she's like this this very wise woman who's, who has gone way down deep into the mind and um, he doesn't really go to, to meet her until he's had an automobile accident and his, he's just, his body was just torn up and his fingers, he had to have multiple um, surgeries just to get the fingers, the bones back. He, he's taken in a very humbling way through a, a very devastating crash. And it's only through that rock bottom of like, oh, I'm not going to be able to do the things I've done, that he begins to question, maybe he's more than this genius doctor. And don't we love that in all the movies where the arrogant one gets humbled and begins an authentic spiritual awakening, which is so precious because they start to realize that they've been going in the wrong direction. There's a, so much more than meets the eye in this world. It's a very deep inner journey. And we've had other movies. I've got this thing called Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. So 
um, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, similar story. An amazing gymnast, but motor, very prideful, arrogant, and then motorcycle accident derails him from the path that he was on, and then he comes to meet Socrates, his teacher. He's already met him, but he's having an arrogant phase with the teacher when he has the motorcycle accident. So it can seem as if things are even taken away from us as we would judge it in the world, but it's actually all working together for the good, to help us turn from the pride, turn from the false make-believe self, and Jesus does tell us in the Course that you're so confused in this sleeping state, or you're sleeping and dreaming, that you can't judge your advances from your retreats. You can't even tell when you're moving ahead or you're falling back, because when the mind's asleep, it's so confused. It's lost in the dream world, and that's what makes it so frustrating. That's why suicide is the number one cause of death on the planet. It's so frustrating when you don't know who you are and you keep going in circles, going in circles and they aren't going anywhere, you're not succeeding. So, this journey, I feel like all of us go through that and yet it does not have to be a long journey. It can be shortened immeasurably by our desire for miracles. Miracles will collapse time. Miracles bring the Alpha and the Omega together. They bring us back to our true self in the moment. And it doesn't have to be struggle and difficulty. If we're very willing to tune into guidance and be very intuitive, it can be a gentle journey. And that's really what we're encouraging all of you to do, is go for the gentle journey. The bigger your yes is to spirit, the bigger your yes is to God, it means in your heart of hearts, you're saying, I want to go home. Kind of like the Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. But home is not a place, it's a state of mind that Jesus has called heaven, and Buddha called nirvana. When you put that as first priority in your life, things will move swiftly. The journey in the parable of David seemed to take decades, but the people I meet are going through this much, much faster. We have the mighty companions, Jesus calls them, or down in Australia we call them the mighty mates. The mighty mates come in floods. When you are ready, the mighty mates will start showing up. And they're reflections of your desire to wake up. We're not talking about wake up in some far distant future lifetime. We're actually coming into the experience that if you really open your heart up and go for it, you can have this experience. We were just meeting with a publisher of my book in Japan. The book is Awakening Through a Course in Miracles, and this man owns a publishing company, but he only publishes profound, deep spiritual books. He's only publishing, you know, Buddha, Lao Tzu, Krishnamurti, that he won't touch anything. He's not interested in the New Age. He's not interested in a lot of things. He's only publishing these deep books. And he met with us when we had a, an interview with uh, the Star Magazine and um, Spirit Natural is, is the name of this company. But they, he's very shy, but then he started talking about enlightenment and asking all kinds of questions, enlightenment, and, and he just was very sincere looking at us. He said, is enlightenment possible in this lifetime? And we were nodding to him. Because, because we are living in an experience that the Course is pointing towards. We don't have struggles and difficulties. I know we, have, we could talk about the past, which for me is a distant past, where there was a lot of ego reactions and resistances, but, but actually we're living in a state of mind where we're used so fully in communication, as Francis mentioned, all day long with calls, Skype calls, communing and meditation, you know, everything is only about communication. There's nothing else but communication. And in my case, it's, it's been, the travel's been going on for 25 years, so that's a quarter of a century. And the work with the Course is, is three decades old, so the Course is not something that, that I necessarily have around anymore as a book. I've 
been put in touch with the internal teacher, and the internal teacher does everything through me, so to speak. There's no need to go back and refer to lessons or refer to things. The Spirit can quote those things and can use those things, but even that would only be helpful if your attitude and your state of mind demonstrates what the words are talking about. Because, as we know with little children, if the parents are trying to teach them something, but the parent is not demonstrating in action what the parent is speaking about, the kids will just turn off and, and turn away. If a parent tells a teenager, stop smoking, and the parent is still smoking, that sends a message to the teenager like, mm, can't count on this, uh, look elsewhere for instructions. I'm going to turn this parent off. So we have to have consistency, we have to have integrity, we have to have honesty. Our life has to become a living demonstration of joy, of glee, of happiness. And it, you're going to meet a lot of people in this world as you move through this lifetime. And most of them are not going to be Course in Miracles students, I'll tell you. They're not even going to be esoteric or metaphysical students. So you're not going to be going around talking metaphysics. I've been traveling for 25 years and I will talk metaphysics in these gatherings if it's helpful, although people are actually more interested in the practical application because many people have been studying metaphysics for years. They're very familiar, not just with the Course, but there's great non-dual traditions that have been around for centuries. They're interested in how do I put this in practical application without exception. That's where they're interested. That's where the focus is. So, for us, it's a very gleeful experience and it propels us. Uh, this, this meeting we have with the publisher, he's like, don't you get tired and all this travel and do you get jet lag? And we get all the questions. But um, apparently, because we're so transparent, because we put so much out on the internet, we, we do that, I've been doing that for so many years, that people follow along we were at a crosswalk in Tokyo, Japan. We'd just been to a, a mall and we went to have a bite to eat and we were coming back and we were walking up to this crosswalk and there were two Japanese women uh, and the crosswalk was going to take us across to our hotel where we were doing a, a gathering like this, a conference the next day. And then these two Japanese women were, oh, they saw us, oh, oh, oh. And they're making this big deal, they're having a big fuss, almost ready to, to jump up and down, they're just so excited. And then, as we're standing there, waiting for the light to turn green, they're just going on and on about how excited they are. They said, are you both still doing your liquid diet? <laughs> this is in Tokyo, Japan, the two <laughs> Japanese women at a crosswalk. And we're at a and we, Francis said, well, we did have juices and everything in our hands, but it still was like, it's, it's all one mind, you know, it's all reflections of our mind. And our appetites drop away, as they will, when you focus just on communication, your appetites for the world to start to fade away, because you have the prana, if we use an Eastern term, the, the light energy that you're truly living off of, but to have it reflected back on a crosswalk in Tokyo, that was kind of fun. It, it just starts to be more natural to start to realize the love that you are, the connection that you are. And as it feels more natural, then questions just disappear from your mind. I mean, the, the first question Jesus says that was ever asked, was asked by the ego. And the question was, what am I? But spirit doesn't have a question. Spirit is just a state of perfect beingness. So the human part, the part, the ego part that seems to have identified with the body and with the world of images, asks the first question, what am I? And then every question since then has always also been a part of the questioning aspect of the mind, which is the ego. The spirit is not asking any questions. The spirit can use what the ego made, so initially it can have you start to ask questions about what do I believe in? What is my perception showing me about myself? 
Where did this feeling come from? You know, the spirit can even use those questions to point you back in the right direction, but ultimately it's for a leaping off point where you cease to have questions. You, you are the answer. All the answers are within you and they come bubbling up and you're ready to receive them and then the questions drop. That's how the process goes. Not about inventing more and more questions or trying to analyze things, figure things out. That's all practical to the ego in the world. In engineering, you've got to ask questions about vectors and stresses and pressures and pressure points. You know, you couldn't have engineering without this question. You couldn't have mathematics. You couldn't have any of our academic um, areas without those questions. But the point of the course is to let your mind drop down beneath the questions. Not from a sense of trying to push something away. Even for myself, I spent 10 years in a university, so this is a very uh, familiar setting to me, after 10 years of full time in university. But once I left there, Jesus was saying, okay, that's all behind you now. And I will use what you learned in a helpful way for the whole universe, but I don't want you taking your mind back to academia anymore. That's not who you are. The professors aren't your teachers anymore. He said, I'm your teacher now. And I was sharing at a conference uh, over in Colorado that Gary and I were at, um, that basically somebody from the audience asked me, who, who is your teacher? Who has been your teacher? And I said, Jesus has been my teacher. And he said, how does that work out? with a 2,000 year old dead guy. You know? And the thing was, I actually had such a desire to connect with Jesus that I started getting a lot of signs and symbols from the radio, from bumper stickers, from billboards. I, Jesus was reaching me through all the symbols, but after I immersed my, my mind in the Course and used it as an oracle for two and a half years, and read it for about eight hours a day. Then the stream of thought that was Jesus came into my mind and began directing me specifically where to go, what to do, what not to do. He gave me very specific guidance to start unwinding from the dream of time and space. And therefore, that was my connection with my internal teacher. And I have to say too, it helps speed up my work with the Course, because the whole purpose of the Course is to connect you with your internal teacher. But after two and a half years with the Course, I got in touch with it. And so he was always, when the ego would try to distort something, he would come in, no, this is what I meant. And when I would get off into a little bit of egoic guidance, he would say, no, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to call so-and-so, do this. Even when I was listening to course teachers, traveling around listening to the teacher, the teacher would be teaching and Jesus would be doing a commentary on the teaching, on the course teacher, from my mind. He would say, that's a good point and that's a good point. This, this is a little off. What, this is what it means. This is what it actually means. So it helped me zoom in to the experience in a faster way. And because I could go so fast into undoing my need for the book, then I could be used in terms of music, in terms of movies, in terms of letting the presence use all the symbols of this world that people use and enjoy to reach the people in a, in a very direct way. Hence, we have tools like the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, which actually has become so popular that I think now people are choosing it as their pathway to God. There's Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. Uh, because they've been in synagogues, they've been sitting on their rear end for years meditating, they've been doing all these practices that seem very long and quite tedious and boring at times, and they enjoy movie watching, and they're, they're having these huge expansive insights and flashes of their identity from watching these movies with commentary. So it's become quite a popular 
uh, pathway to God. But you could come in through music, as I did. There's a lot of other ways, too. It's just that that's what we're, we're seeing emerge. How are we doing on time? We've got, we can go for a while. Okay. We do have a, uh, a microphone, a roving mic, so maybe it's time to open it up for questions, comments, anything that you'd like. We can go right over here. Thanks, David. Um, I'm just wondering whether you still have any. Uh, I know we can't destroy our ego, but we can unplug from it. Do you still have any egoic reactions, um, but you're not attached to them, you unplug from them, you're, you just see them pass through your life? Do you still experience those at some level, but without the connection to them? And um, also for us that are still living in our ego, do you have a primary question when we, when we notice an egoic reaction? Do you, or did you used to? Can you suggest a primary question for us to ask of ourselves to get us out of that, to step into our bigger self? Yeah, I, I don't have egoic reactions. I would say that there was a phase of unlearning where, where you become more and more consistent, but then a reaction will just kind of rise up uh, rapidly and the proper perspective or attitude with that is, is really to welcome it when it happens, not to try to slam it down with some kind of a judgment like, oh this isn't right or this isn't good or something like this. So I would say there's a phase of allowance where you have to really allow everything up into awareness. You're not going to try to push anything away. You're going to actually welcome anything that comes into awareness. And I call that allowance. You have to have a huge um, willingness to allow anything to come up into awareness because you're going to undo the denial and the repression of the unconscious mind. Uh, there can be times where you can just be aware of, uh, of thoughts. It helped me when I was reading the Bible and there's all those great scenes in the Bible, including the scene where he's with the, I think the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and this woman comes in and she comes in basically to wash his feet. And it's a very famous scene where she's getting down and to bring out her oils and to wash his feet and and the Sadducees and Pharisees are, are judging her and they start judging Jesus even. Like, well, he can't be the Messiah because if he knew who she was, he would not let her near his feet. And he's very aware of their thoughts and he's very aware of her heart. Of she had been perhaps a prostitute and all the things of her past which he didn't take as anything real at all. And he just felt her heart opening up and coming there really to drink of the truth. And when he started talking about the thoughts that were going on, they were astonished, basically the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And it's kind of like the woman at the well, when he meets her and he says, call your husband. And she's not been with one man, she's been with lots of men, and he can read her thoughts, but he's not judging the thoughts. And it turns into a, a parable where she goes away and she comes back and he basically says, drink of me and you will never thirst again. So when the Spirit is using, we could say, the, the miracle, the miracle is pointing to the truth and it's never using the private thoughts against anyone or anything. In other words, they're just, they're, you're able to observe them and be aware that they're not true. And that's basically a part that Jesus talks about in the manual for teachers. How do God's teachers deal with magic thoughts? He says the first responsibility is not to attack them. So it kind of gets at what you're pointing at where you can be aware of the thoughts, but you know that they're not true. 
and therefore the spirit can use those thoughts as part of a teaching device to teach perfect love and perfect innocence and nothing else but that. So that's really the goal of all this mind training is you can be aware of those thoughts but, but they don't affect you in any way. You have no reaction to them. I remember years ago my mind had opened up so much that it felt like it was one of those giant satellite dishes where I could pick up all the nuances and I was going to a, a retreat in the country, I think in Kentucky, in the United States, and I thought, I'll just come and I'll just go into my room and I'll just have a little rest before the retreat starts. And I went in and I laid down on my bed and my antenna was picking up everything. A lot of the retreatants had come, they were very frightened, they were very scared, they were gossiping or whatever in the other room, and it might as well, they were in my mind. And at the time I was asking Jesus, what is the purpose of this? And he said, I want you to view these thoughts with me and just watch these thoughts. They are not you, they have no impact on you. So it was one of those real telepathic phases of learning to just join with spirit and be aware of the thoughts without identifying with the thoughts in any way. And I did meet a friend of mine who, from England who was going through the same phase as I was. So we would be walking along, we were visiting Ken Wapnick and we were up at Roscoe, New York and walking along the path and then I would pick the thoughts up, she would pick the thoughts up, we would look at each other and we, she would swirl around and like look and we would both laugh because we knew that the thoughts weren't coming from a body. We were just picking up with our antennas. We were becoming more and more telepathic. And we were learning to laugh together at the thoughts, to not react, to not have any judgments of them, to not want any outcome to occur, just to be able to see the false as false. Yeah. So that's the goal of the Course, just to be able to see the false as false and let the Spirit come through you with great love, regardless of who you seem to be with or whether they seem to be present in body or not, all of that is basically irrelevant in material. Yes. Okay, where's there's our microphone. There it is. Could you please tell us your three favorite movies of all time? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. I, I don't have any favorites, but people have heard me say on over the years, uh, at one point years ago I was saying, if you were stranded on a desert island and you had one choice left of a movie you could watch before you laid the body aside, I, I said, watch Solaris with uh, George Clooney. In fact, I think we have a site online, uh, livingmiraclestv.org, where that has the, that movie with my commentary. And people go into mystical experiences with that one. It's, it's so symbolic of moving toward the divine law. Of, of all that I give is given to myself which is represented by this light planet called Solaris. And all uh, grievances and all unfinished business comes up. And even people who have died, they return because they're still in mind, they're still thoughts. So uh, that's one. There's another one that's a Star Trek episode uh, in which, I think it's um, Deep Space Nine, Captain Sisko, and they go through a wormhole and they go into the light. And so it's not any other species, like the Klingons, the Romulans, the Borg, or whatever. They actually go have, have an interaction with abstraction. And that's such a good teaching uh, tool. I think I used that in the movie, in the book Quantum Forgiveness. It's called The Emissary, is the episode. And I've been at tables where I'll just bring out my iPhone and, and say, would you like to 
to take a journey with me, and everyone's like, yes. And so we all at the table go into the emissary with with commentary, and and it's very deep because it it starts to give you reflect an experience that is beyond this world. It's it would be like. Star Trek encountering abstraction and then humbly starting to see that that you can't convince abstraction of anything. That you have to let go of everything that you think you think and think you know in order to experience the love of abstraction. And I particularly the island is Francis's favorite. Um, not long ago I we were going to go to Brazil, but we decided to do a, a, an online workshop, a weekend workshop with, with using the movie The Island with Ewan McGregor and Scarlett Johansson and commentary. And it was so mystical. We had people joining from Portugal and from Brazil with Portuguese translation, but you can share the experience. It was, it's a mind-blowing experience. Yeah, because that movie is such a, a perfect demonstration of what's going on in this world. But while it, within, we don't see this is some, somehow bizarre or is a lie in any way. It feels like fish in the water. All we know is the water. We have no um, reference or position to see the falsity of it. And that is the same experience um, that is set up in that movie, The Island. They, they're in this artificial controlled environment and promised a future that's very similar to the condition we live in. We live this moment for a future hope, a future fantasy. We give everything over to a future safety, security, health plan, retirement, whatever. But that's exactly what is going on. And watching that movie, it's a very beautiful parallel. You can really see through a lot of the things that is taken as granted, uh, taken for granted, or taken as truth or real here. So that is a very, very nice teaching movie as well. Yeah, we, we've just come upon this technology too, where we can join with people all online around the world, and we watch, we can do setups, watch the movie with them, and have commentary. And already I saw people in, from the United States were, a friend of mine from California said, you saw Doctor Strange commentary, please. Like, they were, they're like waiting. It doesn't come out for a week. And it's like, well, just be patient. It'll, it'll make it to the theater first. But because we've given ourselves so fully over to that, then it does feel like that the movies and a lot of stuff that's coming through, we're kind of just channeling it through now, is part of coming to an exp exponential awakening, or what we might say a comprehensive awakening of planet Earth. Like, it's really just the mind. So, when you accept the atonement for yourself, everyone accepts the atonement. It's, there's not like seven billion separate minds, where you have to wait for the hundredth monkey, or for the hundredth Christ to come along and go, oh, we got, we have enough now? Did we, did we knock it across? It's, we, we don't, we're not waiting for a threshold, really, it's just come to accept the atonement for yourself and have your whole perception healed. But Jesus did say in the Course that, in his talks with Helen, there hasn't been a comprehensive awakening on, on this planet yet. And so, the people I live with and I work with and I join with, I'm like saying, is there anything else more important than a comprehensive awakening? Like, what else could we put our energy into? I'm, I'm so into it that I'm looking at joining with all kinds of people. Like with scientists, I can sit down and I can speak. Even futurists or scientists, I will sit down and I will join with them in, in quantum physics is my language. I will use with the scientists, because they can relate to that. They're not relating to Jesus and Holy Spirit, but we can relate in that way. And people who are involved in sports, for example, they love being in the zone. They love that state of mind where everything is just flowing and there's absolutely no judgment. They feel so high and so connected. 
I had went through a lot of those experiences myself with with different sports, tennis and basketball and golf and so forth, so I can relate to that. We're just really looking, we're, we're looking now at a lot of uh, virtual reality stuff. With uh, They're coming out with inventing the goggles and they say we're very close to the threshold of them being so realistic that you won't, just like when you go to a movie and you lose track of the awareness of watching a movie, with these goggles on, it'll be such a realistic experience that your mind will quickly forget whatever its seeming surroundings were. We're thinking, how can the spirit use that kind of technology to have a rapid advancement in consciousness? Because we're already seeing that. When I go to third world countries, I can go down and show the matrix and have a good translator next to me, and it could be an auditorium this big, and the whole auditorium goes down into the, the mystical experience with me. So I'm seeing symbols of this comprehensive awakening, like that's what we're here for. And there's not a moment to waste, you know, why would we waste it on delay, on worry, on concern? The things that people thought were important in this world, they're only important to the ego. They don't have any specific importance. So I'm going around just saying, people join me, it's a dream, it's a dream, we don't need to take any of it seriously. No matter what the news is reporting, no matter what the, the newspapers and the, the outlets of the world are reporting, we have such an important function here in terms of forgiveness that for me there's not a second to waste. And oftentimes I'll be up in the middle of the night doing emails and communications, I was on the, I was up last night and I thought, I think there was a Facebook page for this conference. So I have like 5,000 friends on Facebook. I said, I'm going to invite them all. <laughs> so I was up in the middle of the night inviting my friends to come join the Australian conference uh, Facebook page. Because it's like a synergy of, you want that for everyone. You want everyone to have the experience of freedom. You want the experience where not a slave is left walking the earth because your mind becomes so healed and whole that your perception of them is gone from seeing them as slaves or seeing them as entrapped or caught by the ego. You, you start to see the Christ in them, see the light in them. And I know that's what the organizers, you know, that's when Kate, when I was here earlier in the year, that's exactly what we talked about. We're just like ready, we're jumping out of our skin to try to, to go into the miracles and it feels that way many times. Yeah, that's beautiful because yesterday even that movie Doctor Strange, um, someone asked about the theme, but that is a theme to me when I was watching it. It's really a theme of healing because he went through, he went uh, to meet this mystic because of his calling to heal his body. And he went through this almost like a mystical training of his mind in order to revive his body as well. But it's so tricky because it's only time that makes what we call healing in this earth or symptom removal meaningful. If you take the time element out, you see it's actually quite meaningless because one symptom can be removed only to come back another time or in another form. Even if you managed for yourself to have no symptoms throughout the life, you still consistently perceive sicknesses in this world. Or in the end, the ultimate symptom of sickness, death, will come you know, upon us. It, it's like the human condition. You know, only when the time stress things out, it seems like there is healing going on, and yet you have to repeat it. But the thing is, we always, Jesus actually talked about it in the Course. He said, sickness is function unfulfilled. And that is what I like about this movie as well, because it did touch upon that. If we are powerful mind of God, and we're created as like his mind, like God, <clears throat> we're a communicator, and we don't fulfill our function, as a communicator with God, and we don't use 
the body to fulfill the function of waking up the mind, <clears throat> then there will be stress and pain and suffering, and the mind will start to miscreate by project the pain and suffering onto the body or onto the world, which is the same as this body. It's the same self-concept. So only salvation can be said to cure. That is one sentence in the Course. And when we talk about healing of any kind, physical healing, mental healing, or even just to heal the tiredness, or just wanting to have a vibrant day, it is, in the end, all about do we come back to the true source of our function? What is our function? Have we fulfilled our function? Only function can bring us to life, can bring us to vitality. And what is the function, you know, except communication and forgiveness? And even that is not even really at the level of the form. It's communicate and forgive the egoic thinking by holding the hands of the spirit in every moment. That is our function. And we bring that into our daily thinking and daily decision making. Say, what is my function here? How do I be truly helpful? You know, <clears throat> Because he also said in the Course, the, the mind or the one that is truly helpful is in, invulnerable, invulnerable. And the reason it is invulnerable because it, his mind is completely turned into wanting to give. It does not want to protect its ego. And when you don't want to protect your ego, you must be harmless. The mind is harmless. When the mind is harmless, you cannot hurt anyone or yourself or your mind or your body. So that comes back with any single question that we are asking in this world, in our lives. There is an answer that is so deep and that going to bring truth to who we are and to all the problems in this world. So it is very, very encouraging because there is an answer and we have been searching and searching around in this world, but feeling like there is no real answer here at this level. But there is a true answer, and there is only one answer to all the problems. And we are holding the Spirit's hand to practically go into work that one answer and accept it. So that's why we are here using our examples, and that's why we are using our movies, because that movie you know, every day when we watch a movie or every now and then, that's what we perceive. There is a deeper message if we watch it with the Spirit. You know, we allow the Spirit to tell us, what would you have me see? Just like our daily life. What would you have me see? And there is a very deep message that comes through. So. Yeah, we were open to even having a theme for today, and um, Francis was saying, hmm, you did a little book called Going Deeper. It's like this little purple book, about the, the covers like the color, color that you're wearing today, called Going Deeper. And basically the book is about lessons 79 and 80 from the workbook of A Course in Miracles. And basically lesson 79 is, is telling us that even if you already had the answer to this world, which you do, it wouldn't help you if you misdefined the problem. So, Lesson 79 is asking us, Jesus is asking us, please follow me here, and I want you to see the problem, first of all, exactly as it is. Because his next lesson, 80, is, let me recognize that all my problems have been solved, have already been solved. But you see how they go together. It, that even if they've already been solved, and you know, that's the ultimate down here in Australia. You know, I first came here in 2004, where it was no worries, no worries, no worries, no worries, mate, no worries, mate, no worries, mate. <laughs> that, that's lesson 80, no worries, mate. Is, 
Jesus, all the problems have already been solved. No worries, baby. It's true. It's, it's not, this isn't a hopeful statement. This is an actual statement of fact, of truth. No worries, baby. It's a statement of fact. But what Jesus is saying in Aussie lingo is, no worries, mate, is not going to help you if you insist on defining the problem in form. If you insist on believing you have financial problems, health problems with the body, problems with Mother Earth, problems with pollution, problems with politicians, problems with different people with different ideologies arguing, if you think you've got a racism problem, if you think you've got some problem that's defined in terms of form, specifics, then your no worries mate is not going to help you because you've already overlaid an egoic definition of the problem and you've denied that you have a perceptual problem. So, I traveled around the world and I would go and meet course groups and go into 12-step groups and in 12-step groups, Alcoholics Anonymous, they'll go around, Hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. I was hearing from Jesus that that's what all the Course in Miracles groups in the world need, and there's thousands of them. Greet, meet, and then admit that you have a perceptual problem. <laughs> Hi, my name is so-and-so and I have a perceptual problem. Now, why would you do that at the beginning of every course meeting? It would have to be that Jesus thinks this is very important. That it's something that you have to be reminded of over and over and over. Because how will you accept that there are no worries made if you're sticking with the idea that you've already defined the problem? So you see how humbling this is. That if you can just begin to admit that you're seeing a distorted world, that this perceptual world, the same one that you see every day, the one that you see on the news, the same world that you see when you when you when your eyes open, when you first wake up in the morning and you perceive a world of fragmentation, is what the Bible called looking through a darkened glass in Corinthians. If you can first start to admit that you're looking through a darkened glass and you don't see anything clearly, then you see how humble you would be, like, okay, I don't see anything as it truly is. Jesus, you're with me. Show me a new way of looking at the world. Show me how would I see it through your eyes? How would I see it with Christ's vision? How would I see it that I may be an extension of love? Because if I keep looking through this darkened glass, then I'm going to keep reacting and getting all stirred up because I'm going to see the conflict as if it's external to my mind. So that to me is very practical and then then we have this whole day to start to look at where in my mind does it seem like I, I have a grievance or something that I'm still holding more dear than truth, more dear than peace of mind. That's what the whole course is about, removing the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence. It's actually a really good use of time to do that. Yeah, we can have an actual break now. <laughs> we talked to Patricia, she said that. <laughs> no, you keep dropping your name. I do, I may have to, I'm going to put it here.
kind of getting into some questions there and uh, Francis had one that came during the break. You want to share that? Yeah, I had a question and um, I guess the gentleman actually said most people would like to know the answer and, and, and this question is what we call almost like a number one practical question that people ask around the world and the question is how do I know um, which voice is the Holy Spirit? Which voice is the ego? How do I discern in my daily life? Yeah, that's, that's really the point of all your practice. Um, because it's a question of discernment. And it's a question of purpose. Like Jesus says, there is one question you can ask with anything of this world. What is it for? And that question will start to help you discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus has some very specific instructions in the Course. Of course he's got rules for decision towards the end of the text to help you out. But Francis touched on at the beginning here that the Holy Spirit only uses the body as a means of communication. So that's the sole function of the body. And you might say, you could look around, you could look at, at your smartphone, at different devices, computers, tablets. They obviously have a function of, of communication. Again, with a, with a computer or a smartphone, tablet, you can distract yourself. Uh, I had a friend of mine who, um, in the early years, she was receiving all these songs from the angels, she received like 270 songs from the angels, but then sometimes I would see her on the computer for long stretches of hours and uh, I said, what, what are you doing with your computer? What's going on with that? And she said, I'm playing hours and hours of solitaire. You know, it's, a, it's a digital version of solitaire. And I said, hmm. So, I, I said, well, you might want to ask Jesus if that's, uh, that's the purpose of your computer. We went down to Argentina, and while we were in Argentina, that topic came up again, and I, I just happened to say a line from the Bible, the branch that bears no fruit will be cut off. Uh, when she got back, um, she came into the house and everything, and this peace house that I had, nothing was ever taken from it, but on that particular trip we came back and the LAN cable to her, uh, her laptop was cut, literally cut, and the laptop was gone. That's the only thing that was ever taken from 
Marquis house. So that's kind of an extreme example of the France that bears no fruit. But some of us can relate to that, where we, where we have an iPhone that gets dropped or cracked, or something happens where we're using something and suddenly it doesn't function anymore. That's a pretty obvious uh, example of, of purpose, unfulfilled, of function, unfulfilled. Or, or Francis said that the body seems to break down, or his symptoms. That's just another example of function unfulfilled. The sickness is function unfulfilled. The other thing I would say is that it's going to be a lifelong journey of discernment, but just try to stay as open as you can to the Spirit reaching you using all the symbols of time and space. Instead of thinking you have to hear a voice, and of getting upset when you don't hear a voice, just open it up and saying, reach me. Reach me in any way that you can. Uh, make it obvious. And that was always one of my prayers I would say over and over to Jesus. Make it obvious. Make it obvious. Please make it obvious. And sometimes it's, it's extremely obvious, you know, you really see that. Yeah, and I do want to say that even just the, the willingness to ask that, that question in the mind, what is your will, is so tremendously helpful. It gonna, this is the most helpful thing we can do, you know, by just starting to ask this question. Because Jesus says in the Course that truth will come back to your awareness through desire. It's really not through any method. It's through the desire because it is through the desire of something, wanting something else the truth is pushed out of awareness. So if our mind is connected with God and our body is purely a communication device, then the fact that we can't hear the spirit is pretty bizarre. So the fact is that we need to start to tune in, start to be willing, first and foremost, to have this desire to turn to Him. I would say that is probably the most important thing than whether I, how many times I can hit the mark. You know, hitting the mark and counting on it is not really important. We don't need to do that. That's the ego mind who wants to judge how far along we are on this process. But really, the process is in the moment. Is can I, in this moment, remember to turn to him? That is actually the biggest progress we can make. Yeah, and I think as you progress, the more confident you get into listening to those little prompts and those little nudges. Whenever you can notice a prompt or a nudge or a feeling and you act upon it, then you feel joy, you feel this burst of energy, and that's a real strong indicator that you're on the right track. And imagine doing that for, for months or years where you have that prompt or nudge and you go for it and you follow it. That's a key component. It's not just hearing it, but following it. Because when you follow it, it strengthens the awareness of spirit in your mind every single time you do that. So it just gets stronger and stronger. And it gets to the point where you're, you work towards all, through all those uh, characteristics of a teacher of God, starting with trust, and moving into honesty, and then moving through those to the end, which is open-mindedness. An example of open-mindedness was uh, not too long ago, we were over in uh, Amsterdam, and we were leaving Amsterdam, we were just getting ready to fly out, and we were at the airport, and we had some a little bit of time, and so we had a bite to eat with some friends, and my friend Helena was flying back to Sweden, and we were getting ready to fly out, and then we were so open, we didn't have anything in mind, we were just giving it over to the Spirit. But we didn't have anything clear to, to leave the airport or anything like that. Well, we had mentioned some ideas to friends of ours who we were having lunch with. They had gone away and they come back and just when we're saying, okay, what's next, they, they put these beautiful silver and colored uh, train tickets in our hand at the airport. And we were like, Okay, they invited us to come on an adventure with them. So we left the airport, went on this adventure, and this woman had heard me speak in Belgium years ago, maybe five years ago, and she was guided to start this trust cafe right in the heart of the, one of the busiest streets in Amsterdam, where they had a cafe with all this beautiful 
vegetarian food that they would all make. They were all course students. It turned into a little cafe community where they would make this amazing food in the, one of the busiest sectors of Amsterdam and have no prices at all on the menu. Everything was to be felt out. People would come in there, have a big feast, and feel in to what they would offer. And then they had the, the government, the city saying, well, you've got to have all these cleanliness standards, and things have to be at certain temperatures, and everything turned into like a five-year forgiveness lesson. And they were just the happiest people. They came out serving us and, and telling us all the miracle stories that they had from joining with people saying, feel into it. And the people go, come on, tell me what the price is. <laughs> no, feel into it. And, and then the forgiveness lesson, sometimes when people would have a big feast and leave nothing, and then the chef and all the people, ah, they have to let all their emotions up. It was just letting the whole thing be used for forgiveness, to let go of expectations, and they called it Trust Cafe. They took us on a train and walking, we were on a tram, we had a great feast, we saw all their, heard all their miracles, and then they got us back to the airport where we flew out. But we had no idea that was coming. And the more open you can stay, the more trusting, then the Spirit can lead you on all these miraculous, spontaneous adventures, which takes you away from all this belief in structure. Like you have to, like your whole day is so planned and structured and ritualized. Some of you might know too, when you get into the workbook, when you get into Lesson 135, that a healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan. Jesus says in Lesson 135. Now that's calling you into a very spontaneous life. And I have to say, it's what an adventure. Wow, these last 30 years have been such an adventure of listen, follow, listen, follow. And then the discernment grows stronger, you know, to the point where you don't even doubt it, you don't even question. You know, we're just, you sit there, we look at each other. One time we were in a hotel in, in China. We've just completed a round the world trip, literally around the world. We're in a hotel in China, and then I started to get this swirl of energy, like Jesus is like saying, do it again. And, but I, I looked over to Francis, because I thought, well, we've just come all the way around the world. I said, are you feeling it? She said, I'm feeling world travel. <laughs> so she spent the day on online booking tickets for us, literally around the world. She booked tickets around, and we went, we zipped around again. We went just again around the world. For us, it was no big deal. You know, we're just having fun with Jesus and, and following the instructions. He is so playful. He's always... <laughs> The more you get to know him, the more playful he gets. And the more you trust him, he gets even more playful. He just keeps throwing things. You know, he plays with the climate. He's playing with the weather, the temperature in here. We come here one day, it's freezing cold for Gary. Then it's hot today. I landed up in Tokyo. They said, it's going to be cool. We better dress for fall up in Tokyo. We landed there. It's like... 30 some degrees, uh, and I'm wearing shorts in Tokyo. I come down here to Melbourne, we land, it's, it's nine degrees <laughs> coming down here. And they were saying, better have your shorts ready for Australia, and then it's nine degrees uh, when we land. But I feel like Jesus is just always playing with little things like that. Like, don't expect anything. Don't think you know what this world is, don't try to figure it out even. Just have fun. Have some fun with it. Do we have our roving mic? Yes. Uh, yes, I've got a question. 14 years ago, I was very unwell. And a lot of people used to say to me, Oh, you've created it. Uh, it was your creation. Now you need to heal yourself. And, okay, I went through my treatment and I got it all fine at the end. But always that guilt lived with me like, oh, how did I make this? If I create it, that means I can create it again. But how will I fix it if I don't know how I did it in the first place? And not just that, but also that fear that then you would come back again. And so there was always the, you know, how do I know? Did I create it? 
or was it meant to happen and I would take some lessons from it because I ended up living with fear for almost 14 years that I would be able to create it again if I was able to have done it in the first place. Yes, I'm glad you're asking this because a lot of us have, have read different metaphysical ideas and New Age ideas and uh, I think one of the most popular ideas right now in terms of metaphysical ideas is that you create your own reality. The Course in Miracles is not teaching that. It's teaching the exact opposite of that. That God is the creator of reality and you can, you can accept the reality that God created for you but you are not the creator of reality. And I would say that's a classic example of, of level confusion where the mind is told, you created that cancer, you created that illness. Jesus just uses the word create with spirit. And spirit doesn't create cancer. Spirit doesn't create heart disease. Spirit doesn't create pollution. Remember that spirit is, is pure love and basically the Course is teaching us that you can't bring the truth into the illusion. You can't bring God into the, the hiding device. You can't bring spirit or love into the distracted device. There's a lot of great non-dual teachings that even ponder about how this projected world came about and we'll still use that word creation like, like the Bible does. Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, God did create the heavens and the ego projected the earth and all the rest of the cosmos. That's the theology that we're going into. Uh, the Course, even in the workbook, says the world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God could enter not. Well, that's helpful metaphysics to know. If I'm wanting to wake up to know God, and God didn't create this world, and I'm wanting to, to know God in, in spirit, in essence, then that's where forgiveness comes in. I need to learn how to see something as an illusion and pull my mind's energy away from from believing it is a reality. I just need to see the false as false so I can wake back up to that divine reality. So for me it's been very helpful to be clear of these metaphysics and to start to realize, because I traveled for 25 years and I would go to course groups and that was a common thing even back then. You created that illness, you created that starving child in Ethiopia, you created that tsunami, you created that nuclear disaster, the only thing that the Course has in terms of the projection is a workbook lesson. I have invented the world I see. Meaning, I, believing that I'm an ego, the ego has invented the world I see. And to the extent that I identify with the ego, then I will feel the guilt of miscreation. So the whole point is not to make the error real, it basically, Jesus says, you are not responsible for the error. You are responsible for accepting the correction for the error. And the correction is atonement. So instead of focusing on the belief that you like, have a personal mind that miscreated with some type of illness that involved the body, even though you've gone through a symptom removal now, there's still something haunting you like, wow, if I did it once, what's to stop me from doing it again? The Holy Spirit is, is the correction. The Holy Spirit is our, we could say in, in terms of our mind, our life insurance policy. If you're going to invest in something, invest in listening to the Holy Spirit, because you're investing in the correction. You're not investing in the problem. You want to keep investing in listening and following the correction and not try to get into analyzing and figuring out the problem. Because remember, no worries made is that there is no problem. So why would I use my mind's energy trying to figure it out? He does tell us too, don't project the error to time. So every time we blame somebody, every time we look at any aspect of the cosmos and we think that's the problem, we are attempting to project the belief in separation to something in form. And the ego wants us to do that. Because it will tell, oh, now project over there, project over there, 
blame here, a little blame there, before you know it, you feel terrible, you feel depressed from, from playing the blame game. So, it's really just level confusion of starting to see that there's really nothing in form that caused anything. And there isn't even a private mind in, in form that caused something. It's bringing it all the way back to practicing with right-minded guidance. And what happens if you keep practicing right-minded guidance is you will be convinced that, that that's where you live, so to speak, with regard to earth. You live in your right mind. And in the perfect innocence of the right mind, where there's no guilt, you have no problems. That's the step back towards heaven, is to come back to right-minded perception. So it's, it's a glorious message. It takes it away from trying to figure things out, because we've all come from that belief system, diagnose the problem, and then go for the solution. And even Dr. Strange, he was the, the epitome of, of a medical doctor, but when he was finally told by his teacher that he, he could choose to go back and seem to heal his fingers, his body, but that would be the lesser in the plan. And Jesus even says in the Course, there are those who have laid aside the body to increase their helpfulness. The ego shakes its head at that one. It's going, what? How does that work? It, it can't figure out the plan, but, but there are those that transcend this realm of time and space that are, their mind is being used for the greater plan. And they don't even have the need of a body at all. You know, they literally, they're like a, the saints. They've literally transcended the body completely. And if you, if it helps to have their image appear for you, like if you pray for Mother Mary, or you pray for Jesus, or Yogananda, you know, one of the saints, they, they may have an apparition just as a symbol to your mind, but they have no need of a body at all. They have no need to, to teach with the body. Thank you, Sid. Okay. I'm, I'm wondering, Francis, could you help me distinguish between not making it real and, um, as you put it, Thomas Hardy said, looking into the worst of it. I used to have um, panic attacks in the morning and I would try and get out of it by meditating, practicing yoga, getting on with something. But it kept coming back, and I didn't really know what it was, what was the worry. And uh, the heart would beat fast, and I'd perspire. And I thought, this can't go on. <clears throat> and um, I did what Kenneth Watwick says, trying to see the fear and the hate before uncovering the love. So I kept looking at it, into the heart of it. And um, <clears throat> the ego and I wanted to get away. It tried to leap away, but it kept coming back to it, and um, in the end, I was just laughing. There was nothing there at all. You know, it had all been for nothing. And um, <clears throat> I'd just like to know that I'm on the right track with this um, not making it real, by looking into it. Please. Yeah, I think this is, you know, when we talk about see beyond the error or not making it real, it is where talk Jesus is guiding us to an experience that what they were just talking about, the right-mindedness, when you come from that perspective, when you see the things from the Spirit, you see through what the wrong-mindedness interpret as problems, as hatred or as interpretations. But um, I think what happens is this phase does take some degree of purification to come to. Um, what normally seems to happen is because the Course talks about do not make it real or this world is an illusion, then conceptually people want to jump into that um, conclusion very, very quickly, even before that become a genuine experience. You know, we know the concepts and we want to talk about it as if that is the answer but it, it doesn't really provide any real, authentic healing if, unless it becomes an embodiment of our experience. 
And how to reach that step is actually going through a, a purification process. And in this process, we actually need to be very, very authentic. You know, we have to allow the emotions and the thoughts and the things that will not leave our mind to come up to the surface by allowing it and not judging it and not too quickly saying, how do I fix it now? What, what mechanism do I need to find to fix it? It's giving it a little patience and permission to say, okay, what are the emotions right now that, be, that is being triggered? And underneath, I, do, I was just talking to Karen at the break, you know, all the thoughts and, and, and beliefs are still, a lot of them are very unconscious and that is a reason that they still seem to rule us. You know, if they're fully conscious, they're not gonna fool us, they're not gonna rule us anymore. So the purpose is to actually allow all of them to come to the conscious. And once they arrive at the conscious mind, they evaporate in the light. So the allowance is actually invite them to come and knowing that if we have a trigger, a charge, an emotion, it indicates a, a thought and a belief underneath that is still running us. So we're just allowing, giving our attention to them. And then sometimes you probably, you know, sit with it for a while, but sometimes you just, as you're allowing, the spirit might give you guidance also to go to talk to someone or write a journal or, you know, it, in the end, all the healing, all the healing comes through inviting the Holy Spirit to guide you. That is the healing. I have to emphasize so much on that. You know, the purification is to prepare for that. You know. And I think there's so much conditioning. We just came from Tokyo and uh, before that it was China, but we've been going for five years to China and helping people to, to get in touch with their emotions. Because it was almost like an explosion when we started doing expression sessions. It was like an eruption of emotions, like it's been a systematic cultural in the family and with the government of pushing things down. And, you know, we can talk about other cultures as well, but most cultures are, are designed by the ego to stuff down emotions. And so we have two guidelines that we use in our daily living and in our different communities around the world. No people pleasing and no private thoughts. And this can be like going against a lot of conditioning of just swallowing emotions, holding the stiff upper lip to, to maintain decency and politeness uh, while there's a rage going under the surface, that hatred that you mentioned Ken was talking about. So I've done some videos that are on YouTube about facing your rage, facing the hatred, that the world was made in hatred and the Holy Spirit gave it a new purpose. And we need to zoom in to that forgiven purpose for the world in order to see it a new way. But some of the most difficult steps in the journey are the beginning ones of getting away from this sense of pleasing and politeness. And it happens in all kinds of situations, in institutions like the family and at work. You know, people say, well, I can't say what's what I'm thinking to my boss, I can't express my feelings. You know, you have to start practicing somewhere and with a trusted friend or a trusted companion and partner and you start speaking what you're feeling. And we use a lot of different movies for that. There's a, a very funny movie with the, the British comedian Ricky Gervais, uh, The Invention of Lying, where great stretches of the movie is just people basically speaking their stream of thoughts. And it's, it's a comedy because everybody just roars laughing when they see the characters, you know, on a date or preparing for a date. And, oh, the mom calls in, oh, no, no, he's not very handsome. No, he doesn't make much money. Uh, oh, he's got a funny looking nose too, and this, this, and this, and he's, like taking all the reactions, the thoughts are just uncensored, unfiltered. And it's great to even have movies like that that show us those kind of things acted out because uh, it's actually part of healing when you're 
dealing with relationships where you really have things that you've been sitting on for a long time and you need to give them over to the Holy Spirit. And it's just symbolic if you can talk to a trusted friend or, or close friend and begin to get in touch with those emotions and what's under those emotions. I think that's a rapid way towards healing. And this whole thing of trying to wear a mask or the macho man or, or trying to keep your emotions intact doesn't help you get in touch with your thoughts or your beliefs that are underneath those emotions. So in one sense you're twice removed from healing and you're trying to act polite, but you've got hatred and rage going on underneath. So, it's been amazing that we've been able to practice that so much in our communities and does it rock the boat? Yeah, there could be some times when the boat is rocking at lunchtime, when those expression sessions are going, but if the purpose is real strong, if you're doing it for release and for healing, then that prayer just seems to carry us through. Hi, Dad. Hey. <laughs> um, <I'm sorry. laughs> it's just got to be sexy, don't it? No. no. Uh, as I'm going through my own healing, um, I'm getting less, uh, um, I wouldn't say patience is the word, but more the distractions, the mobile phones, the emails, the social media, the Facebook, the this, that, the other, the media. And I'm in business, so I have to use email and I have to answer the phone, but I'm becoming not answer. I get to a point where I'm just don't answer the phone, you know. And, but I have to run my business, so. <laughs> it's like these tranquil mind states are interesting because I'll get into this process of feeling very peaceful, the tranquil mind state. And then the ego comes up and says, this doesn't happen all the time, but occasionally, comes up and says, well, is this it, you know? Um, and I really won't feel like doing anything, but I feel like I have to do something, you know? It's sort of like this interesting paradigm of, uh, and, and um, what's the best thing to do? Because we've got responsibilities in the world, but at the same time, um, you know, it's hard to run a business all the time, you know? And does a camera relate to this, or? Yeah. Okay, cool, just not just me, you know? I thought it was just me, I thought it was just me. Oh, you can relate too? Okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah, that's beautiful. I think that's, that's the unwinding that we talked about, where the Spirit will meet you where you believe you are. And so, with whatever the situation is, including a business, there's going to be a rinsing that's going to occur in the mind. Because the businesses are, are based on reciprocity, businesses are based on the profit motive, and and you can tell that the Spirit is going to take your mind in a very different direction but in a very practical way. And that's why we need miracles to show. Uh, Francis owned her own uh, financial management business and um, had to go from, from steps of, of having her mind plugged into that and then having times, I think you were so drawn to go back and read the course. You know, a lot of people who get into the course are very active in a lot of things of this world and then they feel this draw inward and and the ego will say, watch it there, uh, you better watch, you better not waste too much time because there's these important things you have to do. And for me it was like a symbol of, once I got in touch with Jesus, it was more like, okay, you're going to have to convince me because I've just gone through 10 years at university and I'm so trained for business and I'm trained to succeed in this world and you're, you're going to have to convince me of this new direction. You're going to have to show me that my perceived needs are still met by you. Uh, 
in not by my own learning, my own conditioning, my own striving. That's a big transition. To, we've all been taught to strive, we've been taught to, to push and to succeed and to, to work hard and so on and so forth. And I had that sense from Jesus, he's like, yeah, you, you have to take that same dedication, perseverance, determination and devotion and aim it at me and aim it at your mind training because everything you've ever done in this world where you built up your 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 stamina, your determination, you, you learned how to focus, you, you even learned how to tune your mind in and, and be attentive. He said, I need all that. I need all those things too, but without the profit motive. Instead of thinking, being so concerned about the bottom line and and how much money am I making and how much money do I have in my bank account and all those things that seem very practical and important, I had to be convinced by Jesus over and over. And I have to tell you, these last 30 years since I've worked with the Course, it's like, talk about being rinsed, it's like Jesus was using a fire hose. He was in there just firing away with so many miracles, synchronicities, things just showing up just when you need them. Oh, that's nice. Well, that, just multiply that by many times. That's nice. Wow. After a while, okay, that's nice, like this is getting easier and easier when things are still working out, still being provided. Some, there are some spiritualities that will teach that there's certain things like TV, television's evil or technology's evil or Facebook is evil or this and this. I find it just the opposite. I find that, that as I'm tuned in and listening, that Spirit, Jesus uses everything. I mean, over the years, I have to say, he started talking to me about communications and broadband connections. I'm broadband? What's, what's a broadband? And then YouTube. What to? YouTube. You, YouTube. How do, how do you spell it? U T. No, no. If you. Why? And, and and all these different technologies that have come in that people find that that's how they come in contact with me through watching YouTube or, you know, this thing called Spreaker came in too and it was like, what is that? Is it Speaker? No, it's Spreaker. Spreaker. It's an R. Oh, okay. So, these technologies get used to share and extend and communicate, but there's no, like a profit motive. I have people always emailing me saying, you can monetize your YouTube. Jesus is like, no, we're not monetizing YouTube. This is freely you have received of me and freely you will give. You know, the people, most of everything that I have I put on the internet freely, I think 100%, and then some of the stuff people design like search tools to kind of get at the topics faster and they put a fee for that, but, but it's all there. But Basically, it took me a while to, to start to get into that mentality of freely extend everything and don't expect anything in return. Because that goes completely against business. There's no bottom line in that, except, except it washes away the bottom line, even. That's the challenge. Yeah. And it does seem to be a challenge. I remember having these long discussions with Jesus. I'm in my late 20s, just when you're supposed to be building a career and and upward mobility and all that, and I'm just saying to Jesus, listen, I don't know if you've ever visited this place. And, and he said, no, I was, I was there for 30 some years. But I said, down here, you know, there's this thing called money, and you, it doesn't grow on trees. I'm, I'm trying to lecture Jesus on, on how earth works after 10 years of university. And he said, yes, I know you believe that, and I'll work with your beliefs, but I had, typically in the 20s, I had career goals, I had, I was very much into future thinking, and he was like saying, just relax and trust me, I will provide everything that you even seem to need for you, if you'll trust me. And so every time I would go out on the road, you know, I would be like a road trip with Jesus, I would come back, wow. And then another six weeks out with Jesus on the road, wow. 
And then he took me on the road for basically five years with no place to stay, uh, you know, for the majority of the time, no, not even a tent. They had a tent with me one time and that got taken away. So he was like, almost like no stilts, no props. And people invited me into their homes and fed me and did things for five years. It was like a thorough rinsing of all of those old work ethic conditions. And all the pride that went into that too. Like, I personally can take care of myself. And Jesus said, yeah, that's one of the biggest blocks to heaven, is personally believing that you can take care of yourself even. And I said, that's highly valued down here. It's not valued taking handouts from the government and taking handouts. And he's like, well, you better learn to take handouts from me. Because that's the way I work. I'll make sure you are provided for, but, but you have to relinquish control of even the survival mechanism. And I was like, that's a bit extreme. Why is that so important? And he said, because your survival mechanism is tied into your bodily identity. And as long as you keep in that fear of striving and conniving and competing and struggling to, to make a living, so to speak, you're not letting me give you a living and show you that you have a divine guidance in you that will help you unwind from everything that you believe in. So, it not only worked in my life, but I have people that I live with who have done the same thing that St. Francis did. St. Francis, that's F-R-A-N-C-I-S, back in the 12, 1200s, and now St. Francis, F-R-A-N-C-E-S, uh, but she basically let go of her career, her husband, her two houses, her financial, her financial planning, and even a lot of the skills and abilities that were learned through higher education to live a, a life of devotion and trust. Some people could say, okay, is, is Francis a teacher of A Course in Miracles? I said, well, if, the more you get to know her, it's, it's saintly. You know, you, you don't think of saints in terms of the, the particular pathway that they took. Their life becomes a living demonstration of the living presence of God in everything that they think and say and do. And so the tools that they use, well, Francis can talk very well about the Course, but she can talk about a lot of life experiences because it's become integrated in her mind. So she's She's not interested in becoming like a course teacher, or a famous this, or a famous that. It's the presence of, of love in her heart that's been the focus. And, and I find that that's not even odd or unusual. I have people that I live with that, that are having mystical experiences. I mean, it, it'd be hilarious if they did a reality TV show with me. Because I would be like laughing, singing, doing all these things all the time. And then the people around me, they go off and drift off into these mystical states. Uh, one time I was just getting ready to take a trip to uh, help Kirsten out, because Kirsten had been in such deep meditations that she lost the, the function of her body. She, she couldn't walk, and she's getting ready to go out on tour, and I'm thinking, okay, she's got a book out, I Married a Mystic, about her days with me, but, she, but she's losing the functionality in her body. So I said, I'll go help you out. I'll, I'll show up. The mystic will show up on the I Married a Mystic tour. <laughs> I, I do a cameo appearance, you know. It's like a movie. You get a cameo. So I, I'm getting ready to go out there, and, and Suzanne's been having those experiences in our community, and, and Jackie, and now Kirsten. So I'm going out to help out with the little cameo experience, and then I get a text message from Francis. Francis is supposed to take me to the airport. And she's gone into a mystical experience. <laughs> so I'm trying to help out one who's in, having mystical experiences. And then she, she went to cut an apple. And she went close to the apple, she got the knife out, and she started to cut the apple, and then she went into this mystical experience. And Francis couldn't cut the apple. She couldn't cut an apple. I mean, her mind just went so into God that the apple, everything, that seems relevant on this realm was totally gone. And then she had the thought of trying to 
cut a lemon. She went from an apple to a lemon. <laughs> she thought, I won't have an apple, I'll just have some lemon water. But she couldn't have the lemon either. So she texted me. It's like in the morning, the wee hours of the morning, where I'm supposed to fly the next day to come first and now. I don't know if I'll be able to take you to the airport. So she's typing out, she's able to at least type it out. But I'm thinking, they're all going into mystical experiences around here. We're not getting a damn thing done. And, and that's, that's, that's what I mean. You can see where this is heading. You know, you would be... If, yeah, that's it. It's hard. There are times, there are times when it's hard to do anything, but, but you have to have the trust. That's what I've done over these years, where I kept praying with Jesus, like, oh, you're going to have to work this out. Because I had a lot of beliefs and a lot of expectations. And I was like, you're going to have to show me. You're going to have to show me, show me, show me, show me. And talk about standing and delivering. Jesus is like, yeah, try that one. And here, what about that? And try that. And that's what the Course is. He keeps saying the same thing over and over in a circular pattern. Like, here, try this. Did you get it? Okay, that's all fine. Here, try this one. You like it? No? Didn't get that one? Here, try this. Did you get it yet? No? Okay, you try this. He's very playful and very persistent. But at some point you yield. You know, okay, alright, I get it. And then, you know, then things become natural. You, you merge with the guidance. So there's not even an esker anymore. It's more like you're your body's like a puppet, and you've given the crossbow over to the spirit to move the puppet. And it's so natural, and it's so easy, and you're not struggling anymore with, you know, what about the future? Those things just keep happening, and, and Francis has got so much to share now from, from living this devoted life. And it's also practical. We still you know, can, the bodies can move around through time and space, and airports, and all kinds of logistics. But the, it's almost like Trinity in the Matrix, you know, can you fly a helicopter? Just a minute. You see her eyes flicker, she, she gets the download, and she can fly the helicopter. That's how our lives are. We, we go, we find ourselves frequently in a situation where we're just looking at each other like, what now? Boom. Jesus download. Okay, we got it. Next scene. What's this? Jesus download. Got it. And, and you start, that shows you how practical the guidance is. You, you are never bereft of, of, of a helper. It's always there. Okay. Well, Samuel's got a question. We'll make this the last question, and we'll go to lunch break. Also, Samuel is traveling up the coast, the east coast of Australia, from here up towards Brisbane over these coming few weeks. So if anybody along the way wants him to stop into your course group along the way, please invite him. I'd just like to affirm that there is an alternative way of living. We don't have to live ego's way. Twenty years ago I had an experience and what I needed most of all in my depression was peace. And I was guided to open the book and where it says that you only find peace within yourself. Never out there. And I also got a message straight from Jesus saying, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all things will be added unto you. All things means all things. There's no need really to work hard in the material world, because Jesus has said, All things will be added unto you. And that has been my life for the last 20 years. I have retired from teaching and now I'm simply teaching A Course of Miracles and traveling around the world and visiting groups, encouraging groups and starting new groups just by putting ads in papers and um, meetups. So there is an alternative way to live 
which is much more satisfying and gratifying and fulfilling than um, having a business. <laughs> okay, that's, a, that's our lunch break. <laughs> That's a testimony for God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Very good.